There is a rich tradition surrounding the life of St. Lazarus of Bethany. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, tradition states that he fled Judea because of the plots against his life, plots which St. John the Evangelist mentions later in this same chapter. Um, and after fleeing, he comes to the island of Cyprus. There he is appointed bishop of a town called Kyrian by none other than Saints Paul and Barnabas. He lived there for 30 years before being buried for the second and final time. In Kyrian, now called Lanarka, a tomb was discovered in 890 with the inscription Lazarus, the friend of Christ. The saint's remains were transferred to Constantinople by the Emperor Leo VI, who built the church of St. Lazarus over the tomb as recompense for taking the saint away. There's also a St. Lazarus chapel in Pskov in northwestern Russia, where a Russian monk returned uh, with relics from the church in Lenarka in the 16th century. But now in the Western church, the tradition holds that Lazarus, along with his sisters, Saints Mary and Martha, were put into a boat by hostile Judeans with no sails, no oars, and no helm, and that after a miraculous voyage, they landed near Provence in France. Supposedly, the family all went different ways, preaching throughout what was then Gaul. Lazarus ended up at Marseille, where he became the bishop. During the persecutions which followed under the reign of the Emperor Domitian, he was beheaded. His body was laid to rest in Autun in central France under the Autun Cathedral, but in Marseille, they still claim to possess his head, which is, of course, venerated. Normally, when we think of saints, we think of people who are remembered for their great faith or for something miraculous they did or some great act of kindness or courage they showed. What I find interesting about these stories is that although such things have been attributed to St. Lazarus, all these stories are clearly later additions. The reason that St. Lazarus is known, the reason that these stories were attributed to him, has very little to do with him at all, actually. The most important thing he ever did was die. <laughs> it is not miraculous actions or uncommon faith or great piety or even memorable acts of kindness that make someone a saint. Those are things we tend to think of when we think of saints. But originally, when these sorts of traditions were being developed, people revered saints not because of the people they, themselves and what they'd done, but because of what their lives revealed about God. And that's where these stories come from. Stories like these about Lazarus are invented, but they're invented to tell the truth that people already knew. Even if one of these traditions grew out of kernel of truth, they obviously can't both be correct because he couldn't have been in two places at once. But these stories demonstrate what people already knew, that through Lazarus, people saw the glory of God. That's what Jesus says to Martha, right? Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And that is what she sees. The story isn't about her brother walking out of a tomb. It's about the power of God to give life. It's about the promise of resurrection. It's a story that foreshadows what's going to happen to Jesus just a few chapters later. Lazarus wasn't special. He didn't do anything out of the ordinary. In the end, he died again, just like all of us do. The special thing in this story is the sneak peek into the future that God has in store. On All Saints Sunday, we remember loved ones who have died. And we remember this promise and the hope to see them again one day. We read these stories from Isaiah and Revelation and the Gospel according to John as visions of God's promised future where death is swallowed up forever where mourning and crying and pain are no more, where we and all the people we love walk from the tomb like Lazarus and pick up wherever it was that we left off. That's a beautiful image. It's a hopeful image. But I wonder 
If in making this day all about that singular hope, perhaps we might be missing something. If all of our hope is about healing what was and longing for the restoration of what has been taken from us, I wonder where is the hope for the rest of creation? I look forward to this promise as much as anyone. There are people missing from my life that I dearly long to see again. But if that's all resurrection is, seeing people that I lost, honestly, I don't know if that's enough for me today. I need something more from these stories. And when I read these stories from Isaiah and John of Patmos and John the Evangelist, I can't help but notice that they are visions that, not the visions that look backward, repairing what once was, but visions which point us forward to something new that is coming. Isaiah imagines a great feast where all the peoples of the world celebrate together. John's vision of the New Jerusalem begins with the observation that the first things have passed away. This passing away is what makes room for the new things to come into their own. In fact, the passing away is God's work, too. The voice from the throne proclaims, See, I am making all things new, and I am Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. And so today I feel in myself at least a tension coming into this All Saints celebration. Maybe some of you feel it too. It's a tension that exists because there are certain first things that we are certainly happy to see the ending of, things like mourning and crying and pain. But these are not all that pass away. Everything, including those first things that are comfortable and familiar, including heaven and earth themselves, passes away and is renewed by God. I can't help but feel like all saints, at least the way that we sometimes tend to observe it, is more about longing for people we miss than it is about looking, for the, uh, looking ahead to what God is about to do. We remember and honor these people today, not because they were saints in the medieval sense, great heroes of faith who, whose incredible merit is sufficient to cover our own failures and shortcomings, but because they point us toward the promise of God's renewal with their entire lives, and that includes their deaths. Even death, that first thing that we most wish to be rid of, helps us to see the glory of God, who is Omega as well as Alpha. St. Lazarus is case in point. All he did was die. And yet in his death, Jesus reveals to us the glory of God. He uses Lazarus' death as a means to show what God is about to do. And that promised renewal is not just about raising dead people. That's just the beginning. Everything will be made new. Heaven and earth, life and relationship, all of it. We tell St. Lazarus' story because he points us to that reality. Not because of what he did, but because of what God did in him. His story gives us hope that that promise is for us as well. That's really what makes a saint a saint. That God uses them to testify to God's new thing, God's new creation. It's why we can be both sinner and saint at the same time, because even our sinfulness testifies to the grace of God in the way that God uses flawed people to transmit that promise and that hope of God's new creation. It's why we remember the people that we do today. Those who have died did so in the hope of resurrection, and even in death they testify to that hope. But we also remember people who have just joined this life. People like Wesley and, Hel and Eleanor and Henry. They also testify to this hope, not with their words, because they don't have any words yet, but with their very lives. Their existence is a sign of the renewal that God is already bringing about in this world. 
As some die, others are born. A cycle that prefigures the death and rebirth of everything that is. Even as we mourn the passing of dear friends and family, we continue to pass along their stories and the stories of others gone long before to those who come after us in the hopes that these stories will point them to that promise as well. And as we share these stories, we are built up. So how does that promise change us? How can it breathe new life into us as people, as a community? I've observed before that in this moment in which we live now, this pandemic moment, this moment of social and racial reckoning, that this moment in which we are, this is a moment in which we are called to move forward, not backward. It's especially clear now that there is nothing for us to return to. The old order, the old normal, the old status quo is gone. These first things have passed away. Behold, God is making all things new. So what does that mean for us right now? How do we navigate this moment? I don't have an answer to that question. But I do think that the lives of saints, past, present, and future, help us to wrestle with it, to find something in that question that we can take away. Even as old beloved things pass away, things like institutions and traditions and practices and even beloved people, new things and new people are coming into being. We haven't gotten to where we are by fighting to go backward, but by boldly following the example of those who came before us, by looking ahead to what God is about to do and living into the reality of these new things of this new creation. St. Lazarus walked out of the tomb in St. John's story, but he later died. He was buried for a second and final time. I wonder if his second death can be as much an experience of God's glory as his first. I wonder if our hope lies not in cheating or escaping death, but in welcoming it in its turn. Embracing it, knowing that it, too, will pass away when the time comes. What first things are we holding on to that need to now pass away? What ecstatic visions of new things is God giving us in this moment? If we can hope for a day when the dead walk out of their tombs, can we not also hope for a new way of thinking and being here and now? Or are we too bound and tangled in the grave clothes in which we've chosen to wrap ourselves? If that is true, then perhaps Jesus' final words in the gospel story today give us some encouragement and direction, some good news. As Lazarus stumbles from the tomb, Jesus calls to those gathered to unbind him and let him go. Perhaps this is a call and an invitation to us as well that we might unbind one another. Maybe this is even work that those departed saints participate in even now in their death. Perhaps they are also working in their stories to unbind us and let us go, that we may stand tall and look upon the new heaven and the new earth that God is bringing into being.